All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with me. My name is Mike Shonley, and it is my great pleasure to be here today to be presenting you the E-Corder, the all-electronic soprano recorder. You may be wondering why an electronic soprano recorder. Many of you are undoubtedly familiar with the humble basic acoustic recorder, but you probably think of it as nothing more than a simple child's toy good for playing hot cross buns or <laughs> Nothing, however, could be further from the truth. It's a true virtuosic instrument with a beautiful sweet tone. It's also very accessible, very easy to start playing. It has an amazing amount of music from over 600 years old to six minutes old from all different areas of the world, all different styles. And it also comes in a wide variety of sizes. The smallest one is half the size of this. And then there's this size, this size, this size, this size, and then this size and this size. It also has a very fast breath response and um, it does, however, have a few drawbacks. One is it has a very limited dynamic range, and it's also very quiet, so that can make it frustrating to play either as loud as you want or with louder instruments or to get expressiveness. It also, once you start getting into the larger instruments, they become very big and expensive and hard to transport around. So, therefore, the e -quarter. Now I'd like to play a little video that gives a little introduction to the motivating factor and the development. chip that I'm using that it's based on, which is the Cypress PSOC 5, which is the programmable system on a chip. It has integrated analog and digital hardware that you can configure flexibly, so that's really helped a lot with the development. And this is exactly how it was. was the first development board. When I did the development, I started out with evaluation or demo boards.
basically the whole process in a nutshell. This is now what it currently looks like, the third or fourth generation. So the guiding principles for making it were to give it exactly the same user interface, if you will, as the standard acoustic recorder. So you could immediately apply 100% of all your talent, training, and technique to it, and then start there as your base, and then expand up and out as you see fit. So to that end, it has capacitive sensors so that you don't have to squeeze. You just lay your fingers on it. It has a very low back pressure and very fast, important to have very high bandwidth breath sensor. So that's one thing you don't get on a lot of MIDI wind controllers. Then it also adds a few general purpose pads, some sliders, and of course, once you're electronic, there's no reason to be restricted to your acoustic octave, so you can change the octave up and down to play any size from the very highest little one to one that tall. You can adjust the breath sensitivity. And it also, so it has a built-in acoustic modeling synthesizer so that it can actually respond to your breath in a natural way. So it can do the more natural note transitions and other things like very short things that if you were doing sample playback, you would not be able to do. So this is just the, the built-in sound here. Additionally, it has analog control voltage outs, so you can use it with analog synthesizers. Right now I have it hooked up to a, a Moog Virtstadt 01, which is just a fairly basic, small, compact synthesizer, although it doesn't have too many adjustable features, but it works pretty well for this. It also has a three-axis accelerometer, so as you tilt up or down or left or right, you can have it vary the sound in any way you want. Right now I have it going to pitch bend going up and down. And then for the analog synth, this controls a filter. For the built-in synth, I just have it sending out a MIDI, which then I use in, for routing some of the effects. So you can... And also in keeping it as close to an acoustic recorder as possible, the Cypress chip that I'm using has a very sensitive capacitive sensor, so you can actually do partial hole shading, which is an important feature for advanced recorder technique. It also and let's see what else, sorry. And of course it has standard MIDI out and USB MIDI in and out. So you can use it with any kind of either soft synthesizer or hardware synthesizer or anything in between. So. <laughs> one of the many thousands of sounds you can do, but that one turned out to be really fun to, to jam around on. So in terms of the actual development, so it has, this is the, the current CPU board. It has four, actually five 32-bit CPUs, which might actually seem like overkill, but somehow they all add up quickly. So it has the one main PSOC 5 for doing the general, most of the whole sensing, and then doing the logic of checking the breath, deciding what holes are, are covered, and sending out signals. 
Then, because it has so many extra buttons and sliders, I needed not one, but two additional touch sensor chips. And then, in addition, it has a, another chip for running the synthesizer algorithm, which is 180 megahertz floating point CPU to make algorithm development faster. It was really interesting to notice how differently, easily, the different manufacturers support their chips with Cypress. They do a fantastic job of giving you libraries and support, and you drop it in, it writes the code for you, and 30 seconds later, you've got it. With the ST chip, it was a little more cumbersome. You had to figure out how to get the compilers working, find some library, try to adapt it, so huge difference. And then the sensor boards, it's, they are copper printed onto mylar, actually chemically plated, so you have a lot of flexibility in how you lay out the holes. You're not really restricted to keeping them the same user interface. If you wanted to try a few other things, it would be easy to move the holes if you either have different hand size or configuration or other kind of issue. It can allow more people to be able to play who previously couldn't. And in terms of developing the algorithm, the synthesis algorithm was... So this was done mostly in Python and then with the QT wrapper. So this is the quick, it was very quick and easy to throw together an interface like this and then have a code. And so what this is doing is showing you, you can place the poles, basically the idea is to model a resonant tube which then interacts non-linearly with a stream of air. So these are the poles. Basically, you can think of a high Q or quality as like a bell has a very high Q. It's extremely resonant. A cardboard box, not so much. A recorder tube is kind of in between. So you can hear a little bit. So it's kind of pitched, but not really. And so the idea was to emulate that in software. So I just wrote this so you can set up a bunch of filter of resonant poles and then apply an impulse and then adjust the quality and frequencies till they match. It's unfortunately not quite real time, so that slowed things down. All those people who think computers are plenty fast have no idea, no imagination. Okay. So that sounds more or less right. And then I have a recorded breath signal here that I can also apply. And the code that actually does the, the interaction, that I, you can actually type it into a text edit box and then tell Python to compile itself and then run it. So it makes the iterations very quick and easy. So you can quickly try a different parameter or try a different value. Although it's still not quite as real time as one might ideally like. And then the rest of the development was pretty much all done in embedded C. All of these chips are the so-called system on a chip or the microcontroller kind of thing where they have their own RAM, their own ROM. So you don't need any external components. And then you just have to write the software, download it, and repeat. So that's the, the sound of it act, interacting with the, the jet, the air jet. And so, and now that once you have it, you can adjust the parameters and they actually have physical meaning. They're not just arbitrary constructs. Whoops, but not that. In this case, I, I have it set up so you can adjust the Q value, the quality of the filters. much ringier than that. So you can expand the sound of a standard recorder once you have it emulated, then you can 
go ahead and change it to sound like ways that real recorder cannot. Or you can, you can make it much less resonant. Now, in principle, there could be hundreds of parameters that all can be tweaked to get different sound or either sound like different recorders. And also by changing the algorithm itself, you could make it sound like, say, a violin or a double reed or other instruments that have the same kind of nonlinear interaction between a vibrating and an exciting source. So now I'll just give you a few examples of the kind of things you can do with it. One of them is just to change the sound to a, an instrument that, that the recorder is not. but you still want to do some of the effects. Oh, let's see, the other thing I wanted to show is how you can change the octave. Let me just... So you can play it at a standard pitch, or you can lower it down one octave. Octaves, or using the extra low octave. So things that you could never do on a real recorder. <laughs> a lot of fun. So now this. This is one of the many, many, many ways you could use it in a kind of electroacoustic, well, a standard recorder sound, but in a, an enhanced processing environment. This program I'm running is called Bidual from Plogue. It's basically a drag and drop where each box can either be an effect or a sound generator. So I'm just running the sound into it and then using some of the MIDI signals in this case to send it to a reverb with a longer time so that you can emphasize certain notes or otherwise make it more dramatic. So if you just play it, it has a little reverb, but if you tilt it, then it goes to a different reverb with a longer decay time.
be one way to use it. Thank you. <laughs> No reason to just stop there. You can get as crazy as you want. So now it's kind of the same basic idea, but just with more reverb, more feedback, some delay lines. show you a little bit more about the kind of sounds you can do with a synthesizer. So it has four control voltage outs right now, one of them being frequency, one volt per octave, the other amplitude, which connected to the breath sensor, and it's also a very high bandwidth signal. It's about like two kilohertz, so you get some, you can very quickly vary the amplitude of the wavelength, then it has the control that's hooked up to the tilt, and that's being used to control the, the, the cutoff frequency of the resonant filter. And then the other one can be used, in this case it's hooked up to, I think, the FM modulation setting. It doesn't change it too much on this synthesizer, but you can go as crazy as you want with analog synthesizers. So you go, and then pitch bend is and then also with the, the whole shading. So when you put it all together, change the octave for a totally different sound. So and that's just a very simple synthesizer. You can already have that much fun. analog.
synthesizer file. Or you can have even more distortion kind of thing. sounds you can make with it. Thank you. And any questions? Yes. So it's been a couple years at least. So it started out part-time probably that video I showed you I think was from three or four years ago and then I was just kind of dabbling at it for a while and then it's been maybe like a year and a half or two years of kind of half-time but yeah, it all takes a lot longer than you think. You think, oh yeah, I'll just lay out a new board, it'll take a couple weeks, and boom, next thing, two months later, you're still slogging through. Uh, yes? So you're probably over, but, but um, I was really impressed actually with just sort of these synthesized um, recorder noises. Uh -huh. It really sounds a lot like Oh, thanks. Good. You put that all together yourself? Yep, yeah. And No, this is actually just the uh, higher level sound processing system. So it's basically like one of these blocks is where the audio comes in and then it goes to an equalizer and then to a fader. And then like this is a, a distortion plug-in. So this is all with soft synthesizers. This is a reverb plug-in. And then so... So, so, so this, this isn't even generating the sound recorder. It's just on top of it. Yeah, yeah. So this is the, the sound post-processing. It's really nice the way you can interact with the MIDI controllers, like especially tilting it and rocking it. it really feels like a natural way to want to indicate your intention. So uh, how did the actual like, recorder um, synthesis, like, like how, how does that actually work? So that's the part, yeah, I quickly went over it, but happy to go into, oh, uh, I think, hold on. So that was the part that initially, the basic idea is it's like, buzzword or whatever is FISM, which is sort of like physical modeling, but it's physically inspired sound modeling. So you don't actually literally model everything, you just take the, the high level principles and kind of re-implement them. So in this case, the concept is that you have a, a resonant tube. So these are the, the resonances. So basically, if you, if you have a tube and you excite it, you'll get sort of a pitched thump. And so you figure out what filter structure you need to emulate that. And then you can like watch videos of like a smoke screen of the air interacting with that. And so then you try to figure out approximately how to model that in software. So you see, is the pressure higher? Is the velocity going in? In which case, give it this. Otherwise, give it that. And so that's what... This system was my prototyping system written in Python to, so this is the synthesis algorithm up here itself. And so, and then once that was finalized, it was so ported. 
Well, it's, it was prototyped in Python, and then I just translated that to C because for embedded purposes, you pretty much want C. Let's see, there was another question here. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. I'm uh, just uh, sort of curious. Uh, uh, what was the sort of main thing that motivated you to kind of take on this project? I mean, you, you mentioned that uh, I know they're commercially available with control, but you mentioned you didn't like the uh, sort of resistance that you got. Which, right. You know, I, I, I can definitely understand. I'm actually a Google so uh -huh. I probably want the opposite. Yeah. Of well, you can adjust it. The beauty of yeah. So, well, one thing is I as just an amateur recorder player, trying to learn another fingering was a little bit beyond what I wanted to take on. So instead of trying to adapt to, say, like a WX5 or something, I wanted it to adapt to me. And, and also because there are so many recorder players, so it's such a popular amateur instrument that there must be more people who barely can play recorder, but are in, and I've always been interested in electronic music and so as soon as basically I was just waiting for a touch sensor that would be good enough. So every time a new one came along, I would check it out and say, well, you know, it would work on the eval board and then you put it at the end of a wire and it doesn't do anything. So as soon as I heard about the PSOC 5, I ordered the eval board and then put it on the end of a wire. And not only did it work, you could actually get proportional accounts to how much you were doing it. So as soon as that happened, I started working on it. Any other questions? Uh, do you have the casing printed, 3D printed? Oh, yes. Yep. So this was, this was the other thing that took a while, was learning 3D CAD software and then learning how to tweak a 3D printer. So this was, yes, 3D printed. And then this one was just kind of polished, smoothed, and painted. This is pretty much just the raw, raw output from the printer. And so every little part ended up taking being like a two or three month thing. So writing some of the software was two or three months. They're still laying out the circuit board was another you know, two or three months. Designing the body was another two or three months. So it's like, wait, how is it already a year later? I haven't done anything. <laughs> but it's slowly coming along. It looks like you have a pretty polished hardware. So yeah. It's and then the software is getting close, but then I also want to have a configuration software so you can control like what the tilting up and down or left and right does. So there'll have to be like a whole user interface kind of editing software that the next little thing that I'm sure will only take a week also. <laughs> Are you looking to turn this into a commercial? Yes, I'm hoping to. Yeah, there's some tricks with logistics, the whole manufacturability and manufacturing and with plastics if you do injection mold or urethane casting or questions like that. But hopefully soon it will be commercially available. Yes? It's not similar. It's a different one that's a little less known, but it's a slightly higher level. It's called Bidual from Plogue. Okay. And it's at a slightly higher level than Max. You just basically either have audio or MIDI streams, okay. and you wire them together. So each one of these blocks is, is either a, a synthesizer or a, an effect or, right, but it's a slightly higher level than Max. Yes, it, it, this software does. I'm planning on adding support. I don't currently. Okay. All right, well, thank you, everybody. It's been my pleasure to be here and talk about this, and thanks. <laughs>